Yes. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm your tutor, entrepreneurship tutor, Professor Henry Wiss of Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. This is my final part, part seven, in trying to answer the question, can Bukus culture afford to be static? The first six parts can be captured at those links. Yes, I am not an anthropologist. I am not a historian. I am not an expert in culture. But to attempt an answer to the question, can Bukus culture afford to be static? I rewound my own life history. I consulted some documents. I listened to some people. I went, became part of and observed some rituals and ceremonies. And I analyzed discussions from the very rich Bukus Caucus WhatsApp wall. All this so that I could apply my own logic to generate all this series of my story. Now in part one of this story, I defined culture. In part two, I traced the migration of the Bukusu from Esbakala in Egypt to Muyalawamango in Kenya. In part three, I looked at food as an element of culture. In part four, I looked at housing and marriage. In part five, I looked at circumcision. And in part six, I looked at clothing. In this final part, part seven, I look at selected miscellaneous elements of culture. Remember, I'm doing this as no expert in the area, but using my logic having looked at those sources that I've said. Right from the beginning, I said, if I were asked what the key pillars of culture are, I would list food as one pillar, housing, clothing, and rituals. Of course, there are more. But I choose to look at this, these four. Now, I want to look at some miscellaneous aspect of culture. Remember, I defined culture in the, in the very pa first part of this series of stories. Now, the taboos we hold are part of our culture. Tabo taboos and cultural laws are social institutions that govern behavior within communities. Taboos regulate the way people interact with the world around them by prohibiting the use of items considered sacred. All human societies ascribe to some form of social taboo that is maintained as an informal institution by the cultural standards of its members. Yes, these are not my words. That document, no, Colding and Folk, 2001, Neji, 2010, uh, were my sources. Now, a taboo is a, a custom forbidding a practice or a thing. The Hindus, for example, don't eat meat. A pregnant Jainese woman should not use scissors to cut things. Russians don't show their newborns to strangers. All these are forbidden. All these are taboos. They have meaning in their own cultures. Now, which taboos did the Bukus hold? Look, we have chicken and gizzards, we have eggs, we have the chicken back. Men, yes, 
were allowed to eat chicken. Women were not. It was taboo. That is culturally. That's from the beginning of the Bukuso. Men were allowed to eat gizzards. Children were not. Men were allowed to eat eggs. Women, no. The chicken back, Kumukongo, men were allowed. Children, no. You can see all this traditionally. Maybe there was meaning. Now, throughout my primary school days in the 1960s, I stayed with my grandma, Lusavet Muyot, Elizabeth Muyot, who died in 1965, to leave behind her husband, my grandpa, Jacobo Sittard, or Jacob Sittard, who died in 1970 at the age of 106 years. I remember my grandma could cook chicken, but not even taste for salt. She could not serve what she had cooked. My grandpa would serve visitors and ask children. Today, my wife cooks chicken, chicken stew, and joins us at table for the delicious Busumanengoho. Vindvichenjanga. Things have changed. In the olden days, when barren women or impotent men died, their bodies were removed through a hole made on the wall at the back of the house for undignified burial. That was the way of life then. A Bukus man cancelled his journey if a woman first met him or if his way was crossed by a guinea fowl or an antelope. Those were beliefs. When the head of the family died at old age, his main heart, actually at any age, his main heart, which stood at the center of the homestead, was also demolished to signify his departure to the world of ancestors. Meanwhile, the outside roof sticks, hearts of the wife's houses, would be removed to communicate the absence of a husband in the homestead. Yes, traditionally the houses, the huts, had that stick protruding at the top of the roof. Today, the houses are the ones which you see. There is no stick. So, nothing like removing a stick. Of course, some, uh, some people cut a piece from uh, one of the, uh, you know, furniture or the poles on the roof of this modern house. But the communication that the stick carried is lost. So in conclusion, this seven-part story set out to answer the question, can Bukus culture afford to be static? In part one, as I said, I defined culture, and we saw culture's dynamic. In part two, I looked at the brief history of the Bukusu. We saw that they moved from place to place. They changed geographical positions and locations. And with that, cultures changed. Because culture is also, uh, I mean, geography, climate, and all that have an impact on culture. In part three, we focused on food as an element of culture. And really so that the Bukusu have changed their food, have introduced new food. Part four, we looked at housing and marriage, and we saw how housing have changed. And the marriage, the practice, the rituals, the beliefs, and I narrated how the Kikuyu 
came to take our own daughter from my own home and now the mix of cultures whereas the Kikuyu have their own style and behavior in marriage because of their own but we had to meet in the middle after all we have allowed in the marriage part five looked at circumcision and we saw that strictly speaking the Bukusus might never have been circumcising before 18th century or if they were then they were not doing it in the same style as we do to today and therefore changes have, have occurred either we have borrowed that circumcision from the Saboit or we have modified it to fit the times part 6 I looked at clothing and indeed Bukusus now have no traditional cloth. All the clothes of the Bukusu are actually imported, imported culture. And in this final part seven, we have looked at some selected miscellaneous aspects of culture. We have seen tabo taboos which meant or had meaning in those days, but today they may not have that meaning. So we cannot hang on them and hold on them. Now, this seven-part story has shown that the Bukus way of life since the first century has been a product of the society's traditions and its interaction with other societies. I am persuaded that I have established that Bukus culture is a dynamic phenomenon. There have been those elements of the culture, such as building shrines, Namuima, that have been abandoned along the historical trajectory of the Bukusu. Some elements, such as cotton clothing, have been adopted or introduced from other cultures, while others like circumcision were themselves actually adopted or adapted. New elements, such as giving land to the cult child, have been born. The future seems to promise more abandonments, more adoptions, more adaptations, and indeed, even more new cultural elements. I therefore see no much logic in choosing one aspect of culture and hanging on it and, I mean, equating that to the culture of the Bukus. One element of culture, you hang on it, yet you have abandoned others. It doesn't make sense to me. Not long ago, I was in a conference in Europe and this uh, sub-Saharan African gentleman clad in a four-piece suit with a tie vehemently defended the African culture. And then he was asked, why don't you walk the talk? Why are you putting on English clothes? and yet vehemently defending the African culture. I don't want to say what or how he answered. So, let me attempt to show this dynamism in Buku's culture. Let me look at the past, the present, and the future. Now, that's the past. You can see the past with, with shrines in homesteads, no property for the cult child, particularly land. The Bukusu dialect is spoke pure Bukusu language dialect. Chicken and eggs were not eaten by women. There were three legged chairs or stools. Thatched, we lived in thatched round houses with protruding sticks on the outside roof. We grew millet, sokam beer. I mean, we drank millet and sokam beer as our traditional beer. Non-public circumcision, if any, is what we practiced. Traditional food. We had pure Bukusu names. We had wife inheritance. We, have arra we had arranged marriages. We have deliberate wife beating. Hutu Miyakamaika. 
We have we had killing of the firstborn twins to prevent bad omen. Women or children were to be seen and not to be heard. Remove of bodies of dead, barren, barren and impotent people through holes in walls and not doors. Men counsel journeys if antelopes, guinea fowls, fowls crossed their path or made women fast. We demolished the dead husband's houses and removed the producing sticks of the other houses. We wore animal skin mode dress. Sons could inherit their stepmothers. All those and others were the norm or the normal in the past. In the present, we are now having imported food. We have European and Christian names. We have English and Swahili language. We have imported clothing. We now practice public circumcisions. We have no shrines in the home state. Foods are imported. Beer is made from maize and barley. Imported house design with no sticks on top. Chicken and eggs now eaten by the whole family. Diminished wife inheritance. We now recognize the girl child. We have modern furniture and buildings in our houses. Women, children are now recognized. Modern marriage is practice and of course our utensils are imported. Now the future I can see, I can predict increased cultural adaptations, adoptions and abandonments. So I'm saying because culture is dynamic, let us not blame, accuse those who are moving faster than others in this issue of dynamism. Now remember, these were my four or are my four pillars. We have seen them food, language, clothes, house, rituals. In my opinion, a number of pillars of the Bukus house of culture have collapsed or they are collapsing and being modernized. Let's look at them. That is the roof. I can see food. The pillar of food has, is broken. Taboos. Yes, there are some taboos. But now, not all of them are practiced. I see the clothes. That pillar is completely gone. You can see the house is now maybe hanging on taboos. You know, language. Language is getting broken. Not all of us, including me, can speak pure Bukusu language. Yes, rituals. Some rituals are still standing. So, you see, in terms of pure tradition, pure culture, pillars of that house are collapsing. But of course, they are not collapsing to leave the house uh, collapse. They are being replaced, they are being rebuilt, they are being modernized. And that is my call, that we cannot go on hanging on one aspect of or one element of culture, not remembering that even as we do so, we have abandoned others. So, the main traditional food and the drink of Bukusu at Esbakala and up to 19th century have been replaced by maize meal and busa made of imported, imported crops. The Bukusu traditional crafts touched round huts with protruding sticks at the roof and shrines in compound have been replaced by foreign architecture. Traditionally, or cultural clothing of covering the lower parts of the boat only was long abandoned and the English and other fashions of dress have replaced it. The circumcision ritual which 
was itself an adoption around the 14th century from the suburbs of Mount Elkon is undergoing changes in time and style of practice. So, my four pillars of culture have had changes. We cannot stop the arm of the clock. I see a lot of relevance in the African saying of the fox which tore itself apart, trying to follow two paths. We cannot live both in the past and in the present simultaneously. Yes, there it is. There are the two paths. Yes, there is that fox or the wolf wondering which path to take. There's this man wondering which path to take. Two ways of life or cultures. You want the old life or your new life or a hybrid? I leave it for you, for your conscience. Finally, for me, it is hearts off for the Bukusu forefathers who pronounce the phrase or another word each generation has its own lifestyle or music. Let's not blame our current generation for abandoning old generations or old way of life. Magdalene Nahumicha Wafla, for her PhD, analyzed generational conflict in works by African authors, including our own Ken Walibora's Kufa Kuzikana, rest in this scale. So, she says, Buliselo Hona Kumwenya, also known as Buliselo Hona Zambayagwe, implies that every generation comes into being with its unique characteristics and orientations. These orientations may not be identical to the previous generations, and that this is actually the main cause of intergenerational conflicts. The author then warns, however, change in society is inevitable, and anyone who tries to stand against it is likely to suffer loss. So, if you enjoyed it, like it. Share it. Subscribe. Now, if you want to support us, bring more of similar information and others, particularly even in entrepreneurship, because the next thing I want to do is talk about Bukusu culture and entrepreneurship. If you want us, you want to assist us to that, please donate. Use that website www.mukmik.co.ke and you will be given direction of how to donate. You can also reach us through that email. But you can uh, as well just send via buy goods till number 547-6465. We intend to bring more of this particularly in entrepreneurship, have a cultural way and have a cultural day, won't you? Thank you for listening to us.